It's good to be with everybody tonight. We appreciated that message from Eric. In effect, uh, we can take that and move right on into what Peter is talking about because we're studying in 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, we actually got down to about verse 16 last week. But that's just the end of the sentence that started in verse 13. Um, and I want to pick up there and read through that to keep our minds in gear. And then notice the main point that Peter's getting over is that you must bear up under your suffering. And notice that you don't have to get in the book very far. Well, the idea is regardless of what you suffer, the cause of Christ. And no matter how much you're persecuted for teaching and living the truth and exposing error, that does not give you license to compromise the truth or to cease living as you know God teaches in his word to live. Or for that matter, to fall back on what Eric said, to cease to speak and to study sound words. Uh, Paul said in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And that, of course, gives authority to every person who's Christian to continue to teach the truth to everybody else. We often point out that there is no explicit statement in just so many words in the Bible that says this is for you and this is for your instruction. There are statements in the Bible that says it's for instruction, but um, is your name and address, phone number, and social security number on there? Well, it's only on there by implication. And 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2 makes that clear. As Paul said to Timothy, and keep in mind what Eric said concerning the pattern of sound words, that the things that thou hast heard of me, that would be those sound words, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So Peter is making it very clear that you must abide in the truth regardless of the consequences of obedience to God. Regardless of what comes upon you by way of persecution, you must continue to be obedient. Now, already in the chapter, he says what you need to think about is how transient life in the flesh is on earth, how uncertain it is. And regardless of how good you have it here or how bad you have it here, or whether you're persecuted for righteousness sake or whatever, it's all passing away rather rapidly. As James pointed out, life's as a vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes away. So what are we to do? Well, I'll tie back in what Eric said. We hold fast the pattern or form of sound words. We're to continue steadfastly in the faith. We're to be obedient even if it takes our lives, Revelation chapter 2. And verse 10, because he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5, 9. So we're seeing here as he addresses these brethren who may be about to undergo at the time they receive this letter, much harsher persecution than they have thus far undergone because they're Christian. So we begin reading again in verse 13. Wherefore, Gird up the loins of your mind. I mentioned that last week about the dress they had when they would work, how they would pull the robes up and take that girdle and tie it up and get it out of the way so they could get down to the physical work they had to do. So he says that's what you need to do in being able to live the life and teach the truth and contend for the faith, Jude 3, that God expects you to do. Be sober. Look at things seriously, not lightly. It reminds us then of walking circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. We don't have much time. So what time we have, we must use it because we don't know when it's coming to an end. So be sober and hope. That again sets their mind on eternal life. The expectation of eternal life in the glorified, resurrected body and there's an earnest desire on the part of one who is faithful to God to receive his, his eternal inheritance, which will come at the end of time and all physical things. Notice to the end for the grace, the favor, 
that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Don't look at the things around you, but look at the end of your faith. That is, where your obedient faith will take you, and it'll take you to heaven. But not now, not in this present life, not in the flesh. This always reminds me of what my father's oldest brother, who was killed by kamikaze off Okinawa in um, World War II, but he was also on the in the Battle of the Coral Sea on the Lexington aircraft carrier when it was sunk. And after he had come home, he wrote my dad, and I have the letter. And daddy was just, was younger, as I say, he was getting into the service, did not know where he would go. And one of the things that Uncle Wilbur told him was, that when you get in battle, you do what you were trained to do. You keep your mind on your work and your business and pay no attention to what's going on around you. And that's the best way I can uh, advise you so you can stay alive. And that seems to be the point Peter's making. Do not let persecutions or anything else in this life draw your attention away from the one thing you're about doing. And that is being obedient to God. And of course, Revelation 2.10 makes it clear that we're to give up our lives on earth rather than, well, use Eric's terms again, give up that form of sound words or to cease to be obedient to God. So we look to the coming of Christ for our ultimate reward on the day of judgment when all physical, material things and all of this present world is, is gone. Then notice he says it outright in verse 14, as obedient children. Now, what do you do when you're an obedient child? Well, you won't be fashioning yourselves according to how you once lived when you were not a Christian. Now, we don't know all about the people who received this. I know Peter was the apostle to the Jews, but there would be others besides them who would hear, believe, and obey the gospel. And so there would be people who live for themselves, who live for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. They did as it suited themselves. And now Peter says, don't fall back into that trap. You're converted. You're a new creature in Christ. You're now to follow the teachings of Christ. Let come what may. So be obedient, children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. A lot of folks this present hour are doing many things that are terrible and contrary to the will of heaven. Many of them are just ignorant of the truth that would stop them from committing sin, but they don't know it. So this is telling us something about the background of the people that were converted, and now that they are Christians, they're receiving this letter to encourage them to bear up. Don't compromise the truth. Continue to live it. Simply being persecuted for righteousness' sake is no excuse, no reason to quit doing what God told you to in the way God told you to do it and for the reason God told you to do it. So he then comes down to verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, of course they were called by the gospel, they understood it, and even in the obeying the plan of salvation, following belief in Christ, they were to repent, Acts 17, 30, and which they had done. Remember, these folks had heard the gospel. They had obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered them. Being then made free from sin, they became the servants of righteousness. Romans 6, 17, 18. So what are they to do? They're to remain obedient. Obedient children. And they're not to fashion themselves according to this world. Well, what are they to do? They're to be holy. The word holy means consecrated for a given purpose. It ties in with the word saint or sanctified, which means you're set apart for a certain thing. So therefore, people who are Christians in the way the New Testament employs that word and defines it, members of the Lord's church, they have but one business chiefly upon their mind, and that is living their lives according to the authority of their Savior, Jesus Christ. Thus, we're back to Colossians 3.17, where Paul wrote, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. 
we all know that to do something in the name of something, name of the state of Texas, name of the federal government, uh, stop in the name of the law, means by the authority of. Jesus Christ has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. He is going to be the one who will judge us at the end of time. John 12, 48, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So Peter, who certainly heard that in the flesh, has this to say by inspiration to all of us who are Christians. Be holy as he who called you is holy. And he says, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Well, that's a way of saying in every area of your life and in your conduct. That's the usage of the word here and the meaning of it. And then he gives the reason, verse 16, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. I think that comes from Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 44. The whole idea in the Bible is to save man through Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. And it's the gospel message believed and obeyed because it's God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1 16, that does that. It is the New Testament system of religion that makes us holy and that's what we must understand but you see that he talks about obedience and that is the case if you're not obedient it won't work you cannot be holy as he is holy without abiding in the system that makes you holy as he is holy james would say in james 125 Whoso looketh into the perfect, that's complete, law of liberty, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Deed is, the, is his action. So this is the same thing that's being said here. Your conversation, your manner of life, your actions as you live are to be holy. Well, how are you going to be holy? if you're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, if you're not submitting to the authority of Christ as revealed in the words of his last will and testament, which is the New Testament. Notice because it's written, be ye holy for I am holy, then that ends the sentence. It started back up in verse 13. He says, and there's a conjunction. What I'm about to say is being coupled to what I've just said. And therefore is as important as what I've just said. If you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's word, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Now, the sentence doesn't stop there. It could, but it doesn't. We want to look at verse 17 first before we go further. We are called by the gospel. Eric had a lot to say a while ago about attitude, the mindset, the disposition of heart. And thus, when we receive with meekness the engrafted or implanted word to the point of rendering obedience to it, then we are made free from sin. Thus, Paul would write in Romans 6, 17, and 18, people who heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel. He writes this, encouraging them to remain faithful, even as Peter is here. And he makes it clear that God be thanked that you were past it, used to be not anymore. That you were the servant of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. There's your pattern of sound words again. That form of teaching, that pattern of teaching, being then, when's the then? It's when you obey. Being then made free from sin, ye became, there's a transition, servants of righteousness. Well, what does that mean? David said in Psalms 119, verse 172, My tongue shall speak thy words, for all thy commandments are righteousness. So the righteousness of Christ is in the words of Christ, the New Testament of Christ. When we obey the gospel, then we're freed from sin. We rise to walk in newness of life, members of the church of our Lord, and therein we continue 
to walk in the pattern of sound words. And this is what is being taught by Peter. Now remember how this is to be applied. You people are suffering because you abide in the truth, because you teach the truth, because you don't live like you one at one time lived outside of Christ, and like most of the Roman world at that time lived. You're suffering because you're righteous. But that doesn't give you the excuse to compromise the truth, to cease living it. It simply means that you look at the end result of living faithful to the Lord at the end of time, where you will receive your eternal reward. Come, you blessed of my Father, Jesus said, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And that's where their hope needed to be set, and that's where Peter is pointing them to that. Remember also that Paul taught us in uh, 2 Corinthians, or yes, I believe 2 Corinthians, that um, we're going to be judged by Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There's no escaping that. All is inclusive. Nobody left out. Now notice that everyone, not some or most, or the great majority, but everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now notice what Paul says in verse 11 here. Knowing, therefore, therefore, in the light of what I just told you, the facts of the judgment, that all of us will be there. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Which tells us, having escaped that terror through humble obedience to the gospel, having our former sins, our alien sins washed away, added to the church by our Lord, now in the realm where he's located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Ephesians 1 through. We're interested in getting other people, persuading them to know the truth, to do what it is their responsibility to do, to prepare to meet their God. And that's what life's all about, is preparing to meet God. If you are unprepared to meet God, then you failed in the school room of life. And Peter doesn't, doesn't want these people who have obeyed the gospel, they're members of the church, he doesn't want them to fall. This, of course, destroys the idea of a child of God cannot so sin as to be eternally lost. These, these letters written to churches and to individual Christians that make up most of the New Testament make no sense whatsoever if members of the church can't so sin as to be eternally lost. That's what Peter's concerned about here, even as you'll see in all these letters that I just mentioned in general, written to individual Christians and through churches. So he says you're to pass your time of your sojourning. Remember, we're just passing through. Pilgrims we are. We're to do that in fear. Well, it doesn't mean as children or faithful, we're terrorized by God. It means an awesome respect for God because he is God, the great I am. It means that you develop that disposition toward God as you understand things even better as they're taught by the scriptures and just what God is. And that's a never-ending process. I think of when Moses was approaching the burning bush and the voice came, put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. There's an attitude that's been developing for a long time, and I've seen it develop from my younger years even till now. In the church even, what I mean, of a flippant attitude toward God. I remember back in the 60s, there were some people in, of the hippie mode who said, hi, big daddy upstairs, all that kind of thing. Well, that, that's a disposition of heart speaking. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So that tells us something about a flippant, light familiarity with God. 
one doesn't have to take God's name in vain the way it's normally done by wicked people before they have used it in vain. To profane anything is not to just do it the way I described, as we're all sadly familiar with. But it's to handle anything that God has sanctified in an unholy manner, without respect, and to turn it into something that's not. You can profane the Lord's Supper. You can profane uh, singing and psalms, hymns, and spiritual song and worship to God. And uh, you can certainly profane your contribution to the Lord by making life of it. And I mean financial contribution. You can profane anything that is holy by simply using it contrary to the way God said it ought to be used. And this means we're training in disposition of mind toward God and toward godly things. Then notice how he does this as the sentence continues in verse 18. For as much as you know, this is not a maybe, if, and, or whatever like that. As much as you know you're a Christian, you've heard the gospel, you believe it, you're baptized into Christ for the remission of sin, and you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation. That means your pointless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. In other words, they were just doing what had come down to them to do. Not because they were that considerate of what is God's interest? What does he want done? And I think of the multiplied millions of people in the world even now, to go through life just carrying on what they've learned to do from family and friends and the culture they're in, and they never give a thought. Well, what does God want me to do? But this is not the case with those who are truly Christians. Remember, they've been converted in all that that word converted means. They're changed. When a person is baptized to Christ, he goes through the conversion process. Remember, before he's baptized, he's called an old man. In Christ, he's a new creature. There's been a change. Well, it's not some sort of uh, zap of a magic wand or anything like that. It's a resolve of the heart that has come to know the truth of the gospel. And to recognize that we're cut off from God by our own sin. And it's nobody's fault but our own. And thus we come to understand that through the great grace, the love, and the mercy of God, he's made a way for us to be forgiven of our past sin and become Christians. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Christians and Christians only. And thus we have done that. And in so doing, we have changed our state in our relationship with God. We've been reconciled to God in being baptized into Christ for the least of sin. We were raised to walk in this of life and that we now live as the New Testament says we ought to live. We're setting our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. We're seeking to bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. You know, there's just no other way you can be like Christ and develop your character the likeness of Christ without cooperation, our part to walk according to the truth and to live according to the truth, to bring our lives to subjection to the truth. Remember Jesus said in John 8, 31, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, Father, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Notice we're set apart, suitable for the master's service through the word of truth. Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. Well, what does that do? It means we change the way we think. We change our viewpoint of life. We even are very introspective on the disposition of mind that we have. Are we seeking to have the mind of Christ, as Paul told the Philippians, where he uh, pointed out the one single thing he did was to set his mind on serving God. And that's the disposition we work on, and that's the faithful child of God. Again, that's the person that's steadfast, unmovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know, our labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So we're not living any longer as uh, people who don't know the truth. We're not interested in the truth. Or even those brethren who've heard, believed, and lived for a while, then turned away from it, went back to the world. We're not living like that if we're faithful. Notice verse 19. We've been redeemed, not with these things he says, which are important to the world. They're all going to disappear when the elements built with fervent heat and the earth also, and the works that they're in are burned up. So he says, well, we've been redeemed with this, with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And they're undergoing terrible persecution for the cause of Christ. And they need to look to Christ, who in the process of suffering the ultimate death on the cross, that horrendous, shameful kind of death, yet he had never seen. He was perfect. He was the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. He therefore is our example in suffering. That's the way God saw fit to make possible forgiveness of our sin is through the suffering and death and the shedding of blood of his only begotten son. Notice he refers to him again in verse 20. Who verily, verily means the Greek word is like amen, so be it. Who, we can just substitute, so be it, or truly, was foreordained in the mind of God before the world was. God had determined how he would save man, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. But notice, was manifest, made known, revealed in these last times to you. Well, we're living in the Christian age. There's not any other age to follow in which God will offer salvation to mankind. With the termination of the Christian age, whenever that will be, it's been going on almost 2,000 years now, that's the end of opportunity for anybody to be saved. God's hand of salvation will be withdrawn forevermore, and all men will be brought into judgment, as we noted earlier. And if we have not partaken of his grace and his mercy through the gospel system and our belief and obedience to it, there will be no, nothing that will ever be offered again. I don't doubt that there will be people at the judgment who'll be crying out for mercy, but there won't be any mercy for those who cry out for it then. Those who will receive mercy will be those who love the truth now, who turned away from the ways of this present world is quickly passing away, and use whatever time they had left to serve God here. And if it means persecution, then let's simply let's turn back to these words written originally to comfort brethren under great persecution, that we can be strengthened and set our minds on things above, and ultimately, on the day we'll be able to stand before our Lord and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy, thy Lord. So notice, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, Christ, but was manifest in these last times for you. Christ came to this world for you and for me, for all men. Notice verse 21, who by him do believe in God, Proper belief in deity comes through proper understanding of Jesus Christ because he's God in the flesh. He is very God and he is very man. As John would say, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without him, there's not anything made that was made. Then in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, watch it, full of grace and truth. And by the way, you cannot divorce grace from truth, and you cannot divorce truth from grace. It is grace that provides the truth. This is one of the things that is brought out as Paul wrote to Titus, another young preacher, and he said in Titus chapter 2, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Notice hath is past tense. What does he mean the grace of God hath appeared? 
He's speaking of Jesus Christ. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now watch verse 12. Teaching us. The grace of God came teaching. Teaching us what? That denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. Where? In this present world, this present age. Now, in effect, you could take those verses, plug them right in here with where Peter's writing, and it fits almost the context that Peter has here. Because Paul, who certainly knew about persecution for Christ's sake, and all of the Christians of the first century knew what it was right, to a certain extent, to one extent or the other, to suffer greatly for the cause of Christ. So look at verse 21, who by him do believe in God. What's the significance of that? That raised him from the dead and gave him glory. For what purpose, ultimately, that your faith, your individual belief, confidence, and trust in God, which is built and sustained by your understanding of the word, for faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Notice that your faith and hope might be in God. So we're seeing then that all of this, if we will continue, continue to be steadfast in obedience to the truth, through thick and thin, through suffering, through trial and tribulation, it all works to develop what God would have us be. This would help so much, as I've remarked other times, if we'd realize this world is perfect for what God made it to be. What did he make it to be for? Or, to say it more properly, but what did he make it to be? To get ready for eternity. That's all. Nothing else matters. If you get ready for anything else in this present world, well, that's not the ultimate. Everything of this present world is going to be gone. Well, then what's going to what's going to last? Spiritual thing. Well, what's spiritual thing? God's truth is one of them. God's not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth with the flesh shall out of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth with the spirit shall out of the spirit reap life everlasting. I sow to the spirit when I Follow the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews 4, 12. So Peter is saying, you must stay with the truth, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave his glory, why? That your faith and hope might be in God. And we do well to ask ourselves daily as we examine ourselves, see whether we'll be in the faith. Is my hope and is my faith in God? Or am I, I've seen brethren do this, they get mad at somebody in church and they just walk away from the church, gospel and everything else. Well, their faith never was in God like it ought to be. Uh, if your faith is in God, you can withstand all that kind of thing. You read the New Testament, most of it, as I've said several times already, written individual Christians in the churches, and how far do you read before you come into people in the church, Christian, who were rebuked, who were told to straighten up, who were warned to repent, specifically as the Bible closes in the book of Revelation. You have the letters of Christ through the Spirit to the seven churches of Asia. And look at what the Lord's saying to them. Basically, you sum it all up. He's saying, straighten up spiritually and fly right, or you're going to have to meet me, and I'm going to punish you. So look at verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your soul. Well, I like that. He's telling them, he's telling all Christians, you can see something. You don't see it with the naked eye. But you see something introspective because you know the truth. You know what it required of you to become Christian, and you know that you're living by it to be faithful. Seeing you purified your soul, how did you do it? In obeying the truth. 
There's just no other way it's going to work. Now, remember, he's saying this to people who are already suffering from the cause of Christ. And he's making clear that God intends for you to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, to use terms the Hebrews writer did, that we might remain obedient. We might remain faithful, no matter what we must undergo. So, seeing you've purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Let me be at the end of that verse. We just finished studying 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And you'll remember how much in 1st John he would say, my little children love one another. He said it over and over again. Well, true biblical love, the highest form of it, is uh, agape. The verb form is agapao. And that's what Paul's writing about, 1 Corinthians 13. And that love will always lead a person to seek another's highest good. That's what God did. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that's what Christ did when he came. Remember, Paul said to Titus, grace came teaching. And when Jesus came, he came teaching. And he taught us things to do and things to leave alone. Thus, he showed us how to live. And when we love brethren and when we love anybody, in fact, when I love my own soul like I need to, then I'm going to correct my life when I find it's out of harmony with the truth that God has given. So seeing you purified your soul and obeying the truth through the Spirit and to unfeigned love. Unfeigned is it's not hypocritical. It's real. It's genuine. Feigned means pretend or play the hypocrite. So if it's unfeigned, it's genuine. It's pure. Love of the brethren. If I love my brethren, I'm going to teach them the truth. I'm going to do my best to live it myself and set a godly example of a pattern of living it for them. But I'm going to try to teach what ought to be taught so they can know how to be obedient children. So that's the kind of love we're talking about. Now, when people talk about love and they want to try to talk about it, some sort of sick, syrupy, subjective sentimentalism. And basically what they do say now, you really are emotionally tied up with me. You'll let me go ahead and break God's will, but you'll tell me I'm all right. That's not what we're talking about at all. We're talking about a love that always seeks another person's true highest good. Now, the highest good there is to get you to heaven and to get me to heaven. Paul would tell Timothy that if he would uh, take heed to himself and to the doctrine and continue in them, then whoever he taught, they would be saved and he'd be saved too by doing it. And that's the way it is. The church of our Lord is a teaching institution. It was put here to teach the truth that sets men free from sin. When people start teaching something that causes them to compromise the Lord's will, they don't love themselves, and they don't love God, and they don't love other people. Now, they may say they do, but we don't go by what they say. Jesus said by their truths, ye shall know them. And people, it's very easy for all of us to say, well, I love God, I love God. But loving God is the doing of his will. Remember, we studied that in John 2, where he pointed out, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. So if you want to see love in action, you hear a lot about that sometimes, love in action. If you want to see biblical love in action, the kind Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, then you'll see a person obedient to the truth. So being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That almost echoes the word that James had to say in James 1.18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruit of his creature. So we need to preach the truth. Well, I don't like you preaching that. I remember what Brother G.K. Wallace said 
many years ago, and he's been dead a long time now. He said, I was preaching on what the New Testament teaches about the worship of God in music. And a fellow came up to me and said, I'm just tired of hearing about that. And he said, I told him, he said, you may be tired of hearing about it, but you haven't heard the last of it. And that's exactly what we must do. The truth that saved men almost 2,000 years ago, when it was fresh and new in the world, is the same truth that saves men today. And however many years there is to go, if there are years to go in Earth's history, uh, it'll still be the same truth. I hear brethren all my life, I, since I was a young man, yes, I'm just tired of hearing about that. Well, my question is, is it the truth of God's will? And most of the time it is. Well, why are you tired of it? How can anybody get tired of the truth? I realize it's a challenge to all of us who teach to try to be fresh in our presentation, but not so fresh as we compromise the truth. We might have to be fresh in the, our illustrations and examples, but it's the same truth. It's going to read, the Bible is going to read and mean on the day of judgment, just like it reads and means now. And I'm going to have to give the account of my life in the light of that, the perfect law of liberty. So being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. He says then in verse 24, for all flesh is his grass. Now that's important he say that here. He's emphasizing, realize your tormentors who hate you because you love the truth, live it and teach it and defend it. And they, they're scared of things that hurt them physically. But remember, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But notice what he said. Look at his conclusion. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. We're right now in the midst of one of the most probably turn out to be historical presidential elections there is. And all these people are all up and down and around, and that's all you can hear about. On the day of judgment, do you think they'll be discussing this? Do you think when they're laying down to die, if they have their mind about them, they're going to be concerned about anything in this present world? They're going to be concerned about a great and vast undimming eternity. They're about to step into it. And am I prepared to meet my God? So these good words of Peter are fresh and important. It's so encouraging as we labor to walk straight and narrow way through until heaven's our home, whether that comes soon or later. The truth is always here for us to rely on. Would you bow with me as we close the class? We're going to have a response of prayer. Our Holy Father, again, we're thankful that it's this busy week that we can be together and through this technology, study the word by word together. Help us to put it into practice every day that we live. Set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Help us to seek to bring every thought and subjection to Jesus Christ. And help us to yearn for the day when in total perfection, which is really beyond our minds to understand, we'll be able in a resurrected body, glorified as a Christ in our hands, walk the streets of glory with thee. For we pray it all in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Not our will, but thine be done. Amen.